It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Norton Leonard Travis, JD. He serves as the CEO of Pro Health Dental, which has a unique approach to dentistry by affiliating with large, well-established medical practices and healthcare systems to coordinate medical and dental services. Since its founding five years ago, Pro Health Dental has entered into affiliations with such healthcare systems as the Mount Sinai Health system as well as large medical groups pro health care riverside medical group west med medical group and caramount medical that collectively include thousands of physicians that serve over three and a half million patients pro health dental's model of integrating dental and medical services further its mission of educating the public about the vital importance of good oral health as key to improving overall health and well-being Prior to serving as the CEO of Pro Health Dental, Mr. Travis served as the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of the nation's largest cancer care provider, where he oversaw all mergers and acquisitions. During his tenure, the company grew to over 100 locations, including an expansion in Latin America. He also serves as the Project Coordinator and arranged the financing for the New York Proton Center, a $350 million specialty cancer care partnership composed of three of the largest health care systems in the metro Paul to New York area. Mr. Travis began his career as a corporate lawyer, having founded a firm in 1980 that grew to become the largest dedicated healthcare practice in the metro- metropolitan New York area. He served as a chairman of the corporate department of the firm and specialized in healthcare mergers and acquisitions. Mr. Travis received his BA cum laude from the University of Massachusetts and his JD with distinction from Hostel. Hofstra University School of Law, where he served as a member of the Law Review. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, this thank is the first time. It's the first time I've ever talked to a lawyer without being billed four hundred dollars an hour. So I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> oh, try to that stretch must have been this. A long time ago, if it was only four hundred dollars. <laughs> really? What, what what have you heard for a high these days? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, what's the highest you've heard for a lawyer um, billing for an hour? My gosh, triple that or more. Oh my gosh. You know, you're in New York. I saw the neatest banner ad research. You know, when you, you click for a banner ad, how much is the, uh, the amount of money, the highest amount is New York city personal injury attorneys. And it's like $1,100 a click. Yep. Uh, so uh, if you, any of my homies out there bored, just, just, uh, Google, uh, New York, uh, um, personal injury attorneys and just start clicking all the buttons. And, uh, I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, it, I, I really wanted to bring you on the show because um, dentistry is kind of a weird start. Um, the, the first dental school in the world was in Ohio. The first dental university was in Baltimore. And it started out um, separate than the physicians. And we're told, urban legend, that it was because the physicians need a bed and dentists needed a chair. And they kind of went two separate ways. Um, but in uh, the last 10 or 20 years, it looks like they're trying to get back together. Um, the, 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 you know, the mouth, um, body relationships. And so that means to me that the, uh, business models are going to be changing. And, uh, I, I noticed when I was lecturing in Israel, uh, for a week, it was the only time in my life where I saw that all the dental DSOs were owned by medical groups and affiliated <laughs> with hospitals. And that that's not, I haven't seen you know any evidence of that anywhere else in the world. So um, do you think that dentistry and medicine uh, might start dating and courting each other and uh, get married again? I, I think that they should. I think that it's going to be an uphill battle, a slow process. I mean, we're fighting many, many years of history of a major chasm between medicine and dentistry that starts back in the medical schools and dental schools, where as, as I'm frequently being told physicians were basically when the patient said, ah, to look straight down into the throat and not look into the mouth because that was the domain of dentists. So for, from our perspective and, and what our organization is all about is to take affirmative steps to break down that chasm And therefore, while we sort of look like a DSO and in some respects we act like a DSO, we have a very, very different model, which is really driven by, as you were kind enough to point out, our mission of integrating medicine and dentistry and really educating the public, educating physicians, sometimes educating dentists and educating insurance companies about why oral health 
is such an important element of overall health and how we can really make a difference in not just making people's mouths healthier, but making them healthier in an overall sense, a holistic sense, and bring down the cost of healthcare and keep people healthier and more productive. That's what that's what we we believe is the imperative for integrating medicine and dentistry. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. We see it in small pockets. Currently, in some Medicaid clinics, you'll see it uh, uh, where you have a dentist who does provide services under the same roof. But as you're probably aware, the state laws that govern the practice of medicine and practice dentistry generally create barriers to integration of medicine and dentistry in terms of practicing together. And so that's certainly going to be one of the challenges to overcome. Um, one, of, one of the um, interesting things in Israel was um, I, I actually talked to a couple of dentists that worked there and I said, well, what's different about working in a uh, dental DSO or a clinic that's owned by a, um, a, a hospital a group? And she said, uh, she said, you know, I'm a pediatric dentist. And I mean, I, I was working on a kid one time and I thought something is wrong and I was able to get someone else. And before the standard appointment for a cleaning exam and x-rays, um, we'd already diagnosed that uh, she probably had leukemia and start, mm-hmm. started that process. And she just says, you know, every, um, you know, every couple of weeks, um, she just loves to be in the system where she can reach out to other colleagues, um, uh, you know, covering the rest of the body. And you're right. It's a more holistic approach. Um, and can I just point out that, that yeah. that's, that goes in two directions because what's really important and what we really stress in our model is yes, we are doing we are doing various screenings of patients as part of their routine hygiene visit, uh, cardio diagnostic screenings, sleep apnea screenings, blood pressure screenings, and so that does allow us to make sure that patients are tending to any abnormal findings that might that might uh, appear. But we also see it go the other way in the sense that if a pediatrician is with a child and probably a parent and sees something that the, that the child's complaining about something in their mouth, that's an opportunity for medicine to reach out to dentistry and really coordinate care. And we see that all the time in our models. Um, um, to bring this home to my homies, um, um, the reason I brought you on the show is because uh, Dr. Richard R. Rongo um, just merged his practice with yours. And the first thing that caught my eye was a uh, great mind sink a lot. My, my phone number for my dental office was eight, nine, three care. And I love how pro health dental, their phone number is a eight, five, five PhD care. And sure. I saw that and I thought, well, wow. um, so why would a guy like Richard, a successful dentist, um, what would, what, what is he thinking, um, when he merges practice with yours, um, pro health dental, what, what is the advantage uh, for him and um, what was going through his mind to say this this is a good decision? Um, I think actually it's a really good question because it allows me to address both the the medical dental integration model of pro health dental as well as I suppose our DSO component as well. So how did that all come about? The answer is that Richard practices in Huntington, Long Island, Huntington, is a community that has a very high density of patients who get their medical care from our clinical affiliate, ProHealth Medical. So we knew that we wanted to have a dental office in Huntington. Why? Because our clinical affiliate has a lot of patients there and our clinical affiliate has a lot of primary care physicians there, both adult and pediatric. And that's where we want to be as that's the, 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 the greatest opportunity to integrate care. So we decided that we were going to build an office and our standard office runs between eight and 14 operatories. Huntington is a 14 operatory office in a great location and then reach out to the dental community, explain our model and see if they wanna be part of the organization. Richard, and I, I, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but I think I'm pretty comfortable in saying Richard saw both opportunities. Richard saw the fact that as a solo practitioner, it was getting more and more difficult to be on your own. This was even pre-COVID, and where we're now even more difficult. But 
the opportunity to be part of a, a larger organization where we could take care of the things that we, are very difficult for a solo practitioner to do on, on his or her own. Um, but he also liked our model. He knew that by being part of pro health, that he could be part of this innovative approach to integrating medicine and dentistry. And also the fact that they have a lot of patients in the area that as we, as we co-market together, we obviously co-brand under the pro health brand, which is what we do with our other affiliates under their names. So you mentioned CareMount, CareMount, when we operate in CareMount, we're CareMount Dental, we're not ProHealth Dental. Uh, but Richard clearly saw the opportunity to become part of an organization that was doing something different and had the ability to access a large pool of patients that already identified with ProHealth as their healthcare provider. So I think I can, I can fairly say it was, it's a win-win situation join a large office, have now professional colleagues, provide full service, multi-specialty care to patients of all ages under a large brand new state-of-the-art roof and be able to integrate with his medical colleagues in the community. So is the, um, is the um, reimbursement model um, have any differences or innovations? Is it, or, or? Uh, the, the answer is not really. Uh, you know, the only reimbursement model that, uh, that we follow, in, which is actually some people could say is, is unfavorable, but we just think it's embedded in the model and the mission, is that because we work with the local physicians, most of whom accept pretty much all insurances, the variable may be Medicaid, but accept most all insurances, we are we accept insurances as well at least the reasonable paying insurances so we are an insurance based model but other than that at least currently that doesn't mean that we get paid any more or any less currently than our competitors in the same in the same markets we do believe and are actively involved with looking at a, a risk-oriented payment model together with our clinical partners. And we believe that if we can incorporate oral health services that'll keep people healthier, that will actually enhance the ability to have a successful risk model because of course they're all driven by, you keep the patient out of the hospital, you keep them healthier, you reduce their costs and you are rewarded for managing that care. So we think, we think we're teed up nicely for a risk integrated care model in the future, we're not there yet. Um, J, um, what what is it? JD Power and Associates. Um, they had their uh, 2020 U.S. Dental Plan Satisfaction Report, overall customer satisfaction index ranking. Uh, dental Dental Quest was number one. Um, you score between uh, one and a thousand. They had 801. Aetna was number two, 791. Then Humana, the industry average is 771. Cigna, then United Healthcare Dental, MetLife Dental, United Concordia, Guardian Access Dental. I was surprised Delta Dental wasn't even on the, um, didn't yeah, make that list. Mm-hmm. What's that? I'm surprised as well. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I don't want to talk about religion, sex, politics, violence. We just had an election, all this stuff. But I do, I do have a, a couple um, – I, I do have one. It's glaringly obvious that the, the final business model of the delivery of health care, medical, dental, is obviously not um, done yet. I mean, it, it's still uh, in the making. Um, this last early stages. Al- I, I would say it's early stages. Yeah, and this last election doesn't matter which team you're on. Um, it, it shows that um, there's two teams on America. I mean, there, there's two groups of people, very strongly, evenly divided, and healthcare is a big part of that issue because it's 17 percent of the economy. I mean, I, what's bigger than that? Um, where do you think it's drifting? Um, I, to clarify, did you say you accept Medicaid? Uh, only in one of our offices in Queens, we participate in the Child Health Plus program so that children can gain access to dental services. I, I want to ask you a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you are a lawyer. Um, my only beef why I would never do Medicaid ever is because 
it's, it's just like you're in New York, you wouldn't do business with the mob. I mean, when dentists um, mess up and do mistakes with these other insurance companies, uh, they, they talk, they work it out, they audit each other, they, they, they do that. But Medicaid, you're always going to get kidnapped and put in a cage. And I mean, uh, you, um, I, I, I had a friend great guy and his wife screwed up the Medicaid billing forever and when it finally got busted the best uh, plea deal he could get was seven years in prison so oh he, he fled to uh, Mexico and and he just died uh, last Thanksgiving but it's like you know um, there's all kinds of dentists I know that um, you know they end up in jail and I said well you know your, your mom told you when you're little you're not supposed to kidnap people put them in cages but it, it just do you, do you think the the Medicaid and the fraud division is just so is just too heavy-handed I mean I mean gentlemen um, won't do business with them well I, I, I it's, a, it's a tough question I mean I think the answer is like and this is putting on my old and dusty lawyer hat because I haven't practiced law for uh, for a number of years but um, I think I've got two answers to one is do I believe that these organizations have quotas and mandates and they're looking for fraud? Yes. Unfortunately, I think that frequently I don't have to look that, that hard or that deep because there are, and this is of course not limited to the dental industry. It's the medical industry as well, whether it's through ignorance or, or, perhaps being, you know, more deliberate. Uh, there are, there's a lot of misbehavior that goes on in, in the federal healthcare systems. I mean, we see that with the enormous numbers of, of recoveries that take place. There's also, as I'm sure you know, there's a whole cottage industry of whistleblower lawsuits that where private citizens, usually employees of healthcare organizations, can get quite wealthy by being the whistleblower to the government and then sit back and they get a piece of the recovery when the government recovers money back from the provider together with penalties and the like. So yeah, I I have to say taking federal funds has a significant element of risk. And it's something that we thought long and hard about. I think there's two reasons why we're doing it. One is we really felt like in the community and certain of the communities we serve to not make services available to children was inconsistent with our mission and our model. Secondly, we made awfully sure that we have a very, very rigorous compliance program that is monitored by our outside compliance council and our internal compliance team. And we make sure we get it right. So, is there a risk? Does the, you know? Is, the, is there a general sense that whenever the government gives you money, that there's a string that at some point they're going to want to pull some back? Yes. Do I believe that you can substantially mitigate, maybe not totally eliminate, but substantially mitigate that risk by doing things correct and understanding that you need the proper documentation and you need to demonstrate necessity and the like, and make sure you have that well documented? Yes. So for us, it was a balance. But I think the answer is it is certainly a major risk for any healthcare provider, medical or dental, that participates in government insurance programs. And I would say Medicaid probably even a higher risk than Medicare. Um, and this is a um, a tough question, but um, you know, in the last thirty years, I've lectured in um, you know fifty countries uh, all uh, all around the world, and um, I just can't figure out why the the issue is of healthcare is so emotional in the United States. I mean, you know, they, you always hear, you know, all the other countries, you know, the top 20 GPs have socialized medicine. Amer- um, America does for senior citizens through Medicare. Uh, they have it through the poor state by state in Medicaid. I thought oh, I thought the Obama thing with the Affordable Health Care Act um, was the worst marketing branding position I'd ever seen because every one of my patients who was bad-mouthing it, I'd say, well, on your chart, you you have access. And they go, yeah, that that's not Obamacare, and I'm like, yeah, that is. That's mm-hmm. the Affordable Health Care Act. But nobody, I I still haven't met anybody receiving access for the poor uh, that have any idea that it's related to uh, um, 
the Affordable Health Care Act, known as Obamacare, whatever. But, but why do you think it's so emotional? And since we're at a dead heat tie 50-50, where do you see it drifting in the next 10 years? I mean, you know, historically, I love that book by Paul Starr, the uh, – um, the rise of the American healthcare system, and um, where they said, you know, the people were always saying they wanted four things. When they got injured, uh, they they wanted workers' comp, and they got that. And then when they were too old to work, they wanted old age retirement, and they got that. That's Social Security. And then when they um, 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 un- unemployment, when they got laid off. I mean, when they finished the railroad, the railroad companies left five thousand Asian people out in the middle of the Nevada. And when they, they, when they got laid off or quit, they wanted unemployment insurance. They got that. So according to Roosevelt, the four pillars were um, unemployment, workers' comp, old age insurance, and health care. And they got three out of four for everyone. Right. They got one. The last one is for over 65 and poverty. The middle is the last bastion there. It, it's a huge battle. Where is it going? Where, where do you think it will go in the next 10 years? So I try to stay away from – political issues and, <laughs> and, and but the truth is howard this is a purely political issue i mean uh, i don't think that anybody no matter which side of the aisle they're on would say that they don't think that people should have access to health care it's a question of how we fund it it's a question of what how major a role the government plays my own personal view is i would be surprised if we move much deeper than Obamacare into a, a, a socialized medicine approach. I just think that we're too embedded in our private insurance model that many people are, and I think that this became clear during the Democratic debates. I, I had no idea we were going to go into these kinds of topics, but I'm happy to talk about <laughs> them. Is, uh, you know, I think that the majority view, other than perhaps you know the Bernie Sanders view, was that no one wanted to take away private health insurance. People are, if they're happy with it, it was just, I think we're just looking at possibly whether or not there, there's a need to widen the safety net that, that Obamacare was looking to protect. But I would be surprised if we see a Medicare for All program or anything of that nature. I just think that we're too embedded in our, in our current system. Um, and I think that you also have to look at realistically, healthcare is big business. If you start moving into a government controlled system, it's obviously going to have an impact on pricing. The lobbyists are going to have something to say about that. And I just think that, that I think will narrow the, 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 the pool of uninsured and make sure the pre-existing conditions are remain remain protected and the like, but I'd be surprised if we go much further than that. So and, you, and, and can I just add one thing, which yeah. is I'm a new I'm a newcomer to dentistry. I mean I've I've spent my entire career, which is forty or so years, in a healthcare services business, say there's a lawyer or as a healthcare on as a, as a healthcare executive, entrepreneur. Uh, dentistry is a new world to me. It's only been doing this for five years. And I think we all would agree that dental insurance, by and large, is a completely different animal than medical insurance. To a large degree, dental insurance, as you know, for many, many people is simply a a subsidy against the cost of, of, of dentistry, capped benefits, not really providing comprehensive coverage so that, you know, when people go visit a physician, and they have health insurance, they know they have a deductible amount, they know they have a co-insurance amount, but they think they have insurance. That is not true, as you know, of many, if not most, dental plans. They, they contribute towards cost on a limited basis, but it's not really insurance. And still, I can tell you in, in our business, and I think the majority, even if you accept, widely accept insurances, because of cap benefits, uh, uh, limitation on covered services and the like, you're still seeing the majority of your revenue coming from the patient themselves, either because they have no insurance or because they have to cover what's not covered by their insurance plan. So I, I think dentistry's got a long ways to go for it to really be considered dental insurance. I I think it's... um. um... It's really amazing. Um, um, when I was lecturing in China, um, the, the Chinese dentist, um, 
you, you, you could tell they, they thought the whole concept of uh, dental insurance was moral hazard. And they explained to me that, you know, you drink Coca-Cola and eat chocolate all day and, and have 10 cavities. Why should your boss or government pay for it? You should pay for that, and that would change your behavior. And um, do you think that's a lar- large part? I, I, I know the past that I lived through, like like when the AIDS epidemic came out, you know, a lot of people were like, well, that, that's a behavior problem. You know, that, that's, that's a, not a medical problem. And, right. and uh, so do, do you think that's part of the dental dilemma that a oh, lot of people I, I perceive it? No question. Look, all we need to do, Howard, is go to our northern uh, neighbor up into Canada, which, which has, you know, a, which... I am I am sort of a Canadian. By, by my folks were from Canada. My wife's a Canadian. My daughter lives up there. So and all of my family's from Canada. So I, I, I'm pretty familiar with the Canadian system, especially in Ontario, the OHIP system. And essentially, you have broad, comprehensive coverage. You know, with all of the pitfalls of socialized medicine, but you have broad, comprehensive coverage on the medical side, and no coverage for dentistry. So what does that tell you in terms of social policy, in terms of the importance of taking good care of your mouth? To me, it means that there's a long ways to go for people to understand that good oral health is going to not only have somebody have their mouth look better or feel better, but it's actually going to make them healthier from an overall health perspective. And, and, and so that, that to me is a glaring example of how far we have to go. So from the um, b- back to this report from JD Power and Associates on dental plan satisfaction slightly decreases. Um, where, what do you think the consumer? What do you, what do you think the uh, one thousand uh, surveyed people that have dental insurance from uh, Dental Quest, Aetna, Humana, whatever? What what do you think they were liking and not liking about their insurance? I know on my side, um, the the thing that bothered me the most about the whole. Affordable Health Care Act is that, you know, we were over here screaming, saying, um, look, man, you got a uh, 30% of our costs is paperwork. When someone comes in, um, we have to have a human, the most expensive part, you know, people, time, and money. We have to have a person call the company and wait on the phone and try to get all this approved. It's like, why don't they have an app on their smartphone that we mm-hmm. scan? Why don't we, I mean, and I was screaming that, um, my gosh, if he just, automated that system uh i mean he, he could save 30 percent of the health care costs without changing anything um but but that's from the provider point of view the paperwork is a mess and you ask anybody in american what do insurance companies do oh they're perfect at um collecting the premium and then they can't make the claim i mean that that's every, everybody assumes that's what they're trying to do and mm-hmm. if, and i'm a cynical bastard and i i kind of look at uh these insurance companies like well, that's what they're doing. They just they, they got the claim, and they're, they're just delay, 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 because um, it's just annoying to have to have a full-time human sit up there all day long calling insurance companies, and every time we try to automate it, it doesn't work. And for uh, it's, it's like the voting, the same thing as the voting. I mean, um, here I have a smartphone that can recognize my voice. It sees me to, to sign in. It's with me at all times. This phone... It's probably a 99% chance this phone can verify this is Howard. I go in to vote, and I have to pull out my driver's license. You know, wow, mm-hmm. high tech. And then um, they couldn't um, – I couldn't vote because I had uh, um, sold my house and put my uh, dental office as my residence, and you can't vote – um, from a residency of a commercial property. So I had to show them uh, my home. So I just called my comptroller. She takes a picture, texts it to me. I show it to her on my smartphone, and she's, oh, okay, so she approves it so I can vote. I'm like, why didn't I vote on my smartphone? Because you don't want to make it easy to vote. They obviously don't want a democracy. There, there's no doubt about that. It's a republic. Uh, they don't want a democracy, and I don't think insurance companies – uh, want to make it easy to pay their bills, but I'm wondering what is the consumer side on this JD Power and Associate? What do you think? Why do you think some consumers like DentaQuest more than Aetna or Humana or whatever? What what are what are you hearing from the consumer? Well, first of all, I'm 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 going to uh, stay clear of your concern about voting, and because we'll we'll we'll, we'll leave this to to talk about the dental world. And not, and not politics, because I can only get myself in trouble there. Um, I think that what, what you're seeing, likely, 
what you're seeing is that the people who have more comprehensive plans and DentaQuest, you know, which does run a fair number of Medicaid plans and the like, they, you've got people who are paying very little or in some cases employer sponsored dental plans and getting adequate coverage because there are enough providers in the network to provide them with services. On the other hand, as you move down the, the, the continuum to the other end where somebody is either paying the dental premium themselves, which as I'm sure you know, many employers do not contribute towards the cost of dental insurance, or maybe it's a split premium. And then they find out when they actually need services, how little is actually covered and how much their out-of-pocket exposure is, is where you're gonna get the less satisfied people because I can tell you, I hear this all the time from the folks in, in, in our company is that people show up to a dentist, they have their ABC dental, name the plan, they have their card, We have I have dental insurance. They get presented with a treatment plan and they are basically told that only a small portion or even half maybe of the of the treatment plan is covered either because of coverage limitations or or actually capped benefit and that's when people realize that dental isn't the dental insurance they had maybe wasn't as terrific as they thought they had you know they walk around with the insurance card in their in their wallet and they say I have dental insurance i think that the where the rubber meets the road is when you actually need dental services so that's probably where you're seeing this differentiation of, of between more comprehensive plans and really more like subsidy plans. Interesting. So what, um, I do believe that the, uh, what you said at the, the opening remarks that the um, group practice um, really got a big lift on the pandemic when, when the, um, when the COVID-19 hit, um, it's kind of nice not to have to go alone and be the, the, one dentist in your office figuring out PPE and all this stuff like that. And um, Dental Town um, Classified Ads has always had a thousand dental offices for sale. It immediately went to two thousand for the first time. All, all the old guys said, "You know, this is the last draw." And uh, and then the five thousand ads for jobs for dentists shrunk to one thousand, and they were all DSOs. And um, so I've been trying to um, podcast interview all the. DSO King Pensley. I just did an MB2 the other day because um, that, that's the request I'm getting from all the kids saying no one's hiring. They're looking for a job. Um, how um, uh, Marco, uh, economist at the ADA, uh, says that, um, you know, it looks like we're going to, uh, the industry will be down 38% for 2020, and he's projecting it'll be down uh, 20% for 2021. How do you see it? Well, um, I think that those numbers based upon the original uh, what, 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 what Marco and the ADA had projected to my knowledge, leaving aside our own experience, which I'll be happy to share with you, were painted a grimmer picture than what's actually happening. Uh, I, I think that at one point it was that you could hopefully get back to 80% of pre-COVID levels by the end of Q2 2021. Um, I think it really depends on who you are and where you are and what your ability is uh, to recruit staff. I, I think that recruiting hygienists and assistants and the like are a, to, a, a far greater challenge than being able to hire dentists just because of COVID related issues, home care issues, schools being closed issues, that kind of thing, or just fear of, 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 of infection. But I will tell you, I think that um, for the right models that are not uh, um, simply looking for what I guess I would refer to as retail dentistry, but have more of a, a mission and model as we do, um, I mean, we're significantly up from our pre-COVID levels for a, in, our exist, in, in our existing offices. And I do think, and I, 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 I think I'm right, you know, we have done a major, what I'll call public service, whether you want to call it infomercials, that about really broadcasting on cable television, and local newspapers and the like, about there's never been a more important time to take care of your mouth. 
now you know that we see the clinical literature starting to look at correlations between poor oral health and, and COVID. And we, as we know, there's plenty of literature dealing with other you know, chronic and systemic diseases. So I, I don't think this is a one size fits all situation. We absolutely see many, many more dental practices up for sale. Um, I think that that's going to be the case for some time. Um, and I think you're also going to see some dentists who are on the verge of retirement just literally, you know, shut the lights and close the door and call it quits whether they sell or not. We're seeing that as well. Um, I think that, that the other part of this that's going to make the sale of practices more difficult in the short run is, and I don't think this is any different than we've had other uh, 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 recessions, uh, whether, you know, in 2008 or otherwise, I think that it takes a while before sellers or their advisors or the brokers or whomever uh, come to grips with the fact that the world has changed. Pricing is going to be different. Uh, the, the, the willingness of a buyer to take full risk on a practice that hopefully will recover back from COVID is not the same. So I, I think just the rule book has changed. But I do think that the opportunities exist. We're certainly extremely busy with what we would call a lot of tuck-in practices, which means local dentists like our friend, Dr. Rongo, who decided to do this proactively, but a lot of local dentists who say, being in private practice as a single practitioner or a one zero or a 2 z is just too difficult, too expensive. And here we are nearby with our 12, 14 operatory offices. And even though we're pretty busy, you know, there's, there's usually capacity there. So we see this as that those practices can tuck into our model and make these practitioners' lives much, much easier. We can, we can run the practice from that point. And we also do find that many of them, and I think Dr. Rongo would, 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 would confirm this as well, it's nice being in an office where you have colleagues, where you, where you can communicate with fellow clinicians about the care of your patients. And, and we offer that not only within each office, but because we have an integrated uh, uh, electronic health record for all of our offices, we literally have a situation where if there is an expert in one particular service uh, that you want to consult with outside of your office, we, we facilitate that. We facilitate it sometimes with the patient via teledentistry. But you can consult with an expert, one of your partners, one of your colleagues, without having to sit in the same room. You can just pull up the record, and all of that just adds to the team and collegiality approach of being part of a large integrated practice. And it's also following uh, um, the long-term trend of retail. I mean, the uh, if we learned anything in the last three centuries from retail, starting where you live in New York City, the first were the shop houses where you, you had a shop and you lived upstairs, and the next generation said, well, that was 10 foot by 10 foot. Let's go 20 foot by 20 foot. And every generation just got bigger and the bigger model um, extinct, the little model until Walmart and Costco and Price Club and Home Depot were all 250,000 square feet. And they all claimed they got too big. Walmart um, was the first one to said, yeah, it's too big. Um, I, I, I came to that conclusion at about 100,000 square foot for myself personally. I'd rather buy milk at a gas station than go uh, go through Walmart. Um, it's just too big, but my gosh, um, we, we look at pediatric dentistry, the fastest growing one plus one equals three is when a pediatric, pediatric dentist and an orthodontist get together because obviously mom's question is always going to be, do you think little Billy's going to need ortho one day? And they have to fill out a form and make a different appointment. And it's just, uh, you know, putting it under one roof and then Asia, I love, um, I love seeing how. Uh, different people with the exact same problem solve it differently. And the only place I've ever uh, ever seen routinely dental hospitals is like Cambodia, Vietnam, um, my gosh, um, um, you know, where you go there and it's a 10-story building and every level is a specialty. Uh, Dr. Park did that in um, Seoul, Korea, where he's a founder of um, Megagen Dental Implants. Um, but I, I never even see the term dental hospital. Um, you know, there's not, uh, I mean, Phoenix got a 3.8 million Metro. 
Why do you think no one in Phoenix at $3.8 million ever put the whole dental machine under one roof and called it a dental hospital? Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the, the Asian dental hospitals. We've had discussions with one of the major organizations in China. Uh, you know, I think we're just very steeped in solo practice history. I think that, that you're really talking about moving from the, you know, you would probably know these statistics much better than I, but from what would appear to be a largely single, maybe two practitioner model around the country to go from there to a dental hospital is an enormous leap. So, I, and, and I think that dentists from what I've seen, and again, I'm a newcomer to the dental world, uh, are fiercely independent, want to try to be fiercely independent, want to be on their own. Um, and so I just think that's a steep uphill climb. Whereas in, in, in places like Asia, you already see those models in other clinical disciplines and it isn't that difficult. Even, look, even on the physician side, and, and it, which is way ahead of dentistry in terms of aggregating into large groups. And that's basically our model. I mean, our, our clinical affiliates, which you named earlier in, in, in the podcast, range from the smallest as 400 physicians and the largest as 1,500 physicians. So, but there's still not the majority of healthcare services in, in the regions in the metropolitan New York area. So I just think we're, 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 we're fighting a lot of, of old habits and a lot of independence and you know, dentists, physicians, they don't want to give up their independence. It's hard for them to basically be their own boss and now be part of an organization that's going to have rules and regulations and policies and procedures that they will not necessarily always agree with. So that's, that, that's, not, that's not such an easy thing to sign up for. I think that's largely what we're facing here. I think culturally, it's just way, way different than it is in the areas of Asia that you described. Yeah, and if you're uh, still in, uh, a quarter of our listeners are still in dental kindergarten school, so if that flew over your head, I mean, if there's one thing we learned in human history, it's you need transparency and checks and balances, um, competition, um, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and you just nailed it. Dentists don't want to be um, part of uh, rules and regulation. No no human wants rules and right. regulations. But I um, to think outside the box, that's why I wanted – to have you on first, I mean, um, it might have been normal to sit there and think, I mean, you got some amazing people on your team. Uh, Bruce Valerie, director of prosthodontics, chief dental officer. I mean, he's a board-certified prosthodontist. He's a, a legend. And Neil Konofsky, a periodontist. Um, you, got, you got some legends. Uh, you know, and I, I was thinking, well, I should get them on first. But I thought, no, I want to get the CEO lawyer on to see his vision, think outside the box, you know, because that's what that's what we're up against here is just tradition. I mean, uh, you know, you're born into uh, what kind of food you like. I mean, I, I, if I was born in uh, Saudi Arabia, I probably wouldn't crave macaroni and cheese uh, craft dinner three times a day. So um, but what 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 um, what about you and the system and pro health was able to attract a guy like Bruce, who's got a resume longer than uh, there is, and uh, Neil Kronofsky. I mean, th these are just legends in prosthodontics and periodontics. What do you think um, lit their fire? What gave them the why, uh, why they wanted to join your team instead of being their independent um, self? I, I'd like to think that it's the model. It's the, you know, I think that when you have forward-thinking people who – lived, who have experienced dentistry in, I'll just say the current, I'm not going to say necessarily old fashioned because I don't want to insult anybody, but in its current more insular model. Okay. And then you see that, I mean, just the way we always think about it is this. Okay. If, if you were in Rochester, Minnesota and as, as a private practicing dentist and Mayo decided to open up Mayo Dental, that would probably be a pretty significant competitive threat. Uh, if, if so, when we look at here on Long Island, Pro Health Medical, Pro Health Medical with its thousand physicians, three hundred locations, and one point five million patients, 
and they are receptive to integrating medicine and dentistry and working with us and co-branding with us and marketing with us, you get guys like Bruce and Neil and Richard Rongo and, and many others who say that has got to be the model of the future is, and, and, and they're helping us get there. They're, they, you know, they, it doesn't have, make it very clear. I mean, I, I have drunk our Kool-Aid. I love our model. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't happen by itself. We have to be the ones to, as I always tell people, it's really easy in integrating medicine and dentistry. It's really easy to talk the talk. We, as the dental organization, have to be the ones that actually walk the walk. We, medicine is not going to do this and come to us. We need to go to them and, and convince them why having, in effect, an oral health service line, an affiliated oral health service line, makes sense for their patients and for them as an organization. Well, you and, know, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, and, and, and fortunately... We have the folks like, like you know, Bruce and Neil and Rich Rongo and, and others who get it, who see how fundamental it is and really want to be part of a cutting edge organization. I, I should mention to you, I don't know if this came up in the materials that you saw, you know, we're working extensively with Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, you know, they, they have had a, a oral health integration initiative for, for some time. Uh, we are doing joint research with them. We are conducting surveys of oral health literacy with them because I believe we are the only organization, even though we're not that big and we're pretty local currently. I mean, I, I, I do have vision of taking our model to a much larger platform, but uh, who are really doing the clinical integration. And so, uh, you know, it's when you can get folks like the individuals you named and like Harvard and others to come and work with us, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's definitely going to grease the skids for us and, and get us on that path, hopefully to the, to the end zone much quicker. Well, you know, I, um, I've always wondered, um, you know, as all these DSOs have taken off that, uh, um, you, you mentioned Rochester earlier and, uh, I noticed that, you know, no one really did, uh, the Mayo Clinic model. I mean, it seems like all the big DSOs, you know, they were uh, more convenient, they had better hours or what what have you, but no one with that um, absolute focus on quality, which it sounds like that's what you're doing. I mean, you're trying to do this integrated deal. And again, to the listeners out there, um, my gosh, these guys he attracted. I mean, like, take Bruce. I mean, um, gosh, he's a diplomat of the American Board of Prosthodontics. He's past president of the American College of Prosthodontics. I mean, these guys are legends. It looks like you, um, you're the first one I'm aware of where you're trying to do this. Uh, you consider yourself a DSO, right? Uh, well, that's, that's where the answer is we perform DSO functions, certainly by supporting all the practices that are part of ProHealth Dental. Uh, but our model of affiliation with medical practices sort of takes us out of at least the classic DSO definition. I think that we see ourselves more as this disruptor and, and, and innovator, and the DSO part of it is really the, the support services that are needed to make that happen. You know, and, and, and I think the best way to describe that, Howard, is, you know, with all the, uh, now as we know, many, many practices are available for purchase or whatever, you know, we are... We are, we are being approached by many, many dentists, brokers, et cetera. And truthfully, unless the opportunity sits within our strategic plan, which is largely geographic, to be, to, to be within the service area of our affiliated medical group, we're, we're not interested in that practice. So in that respect, we don't really look at how many flags we have on the map. We look at having the right flags on the map and having the – offices that are strategically going to help serve the relationships that we have with our affiliated medical groups. But the, uh, I mean, but the density, I, 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 I wish I could show you this picture. It showed uh, um, the 8 billion humans. Um, there's about uh, a bunch of these 50 million human streaks where just like 
50 million live in abandoned. And one of the biggest ones is where you are from Boston to uh, Philly. I mean, there's just a ton of people. So right. you, you could stay in your strategic area. I mean, that that's that's like two countries. Uh, you, you could stay there a long time. Um, have you... Um, um, have you acquired many strategically fit practices? Has anything changed with the EBITDA? Have they become cheaper since more people are selling? Or is there anything you've learned from that? Is it all old guys like me? Or, you know, what, what's up? Well, it's it's not young trends? guys like us. I'll put us in the same category here. It's, it's it, you know, uh, they... Uh, some of the major uh, transactions we're working on currently involve dentists who have 10 to 20 year runways still to continue to practice. But the combination of seeing how the world is changing, liking our affiliated model, not wanting to necessarily knowing that we're coming to town, if you will, not wanting to necessarily compete, but, but work together. Uh, we're seeing, dentists of all ages being attracted by the model. And, and, and so in terms of, as I said before, when it does involve a purchase, uh, I think that it's just not what it was pre COVID. I mean, you know, you can't necessarily look at 2019 financials and say, that's what I'm going to rely on. You know, I mean, I assume like the rest of the world here in New York, we were, uh, you know, we were shut down from early March until the beginning of June. So 2020 financials are a mess for everybody. So I think that what it does is it necessitates getting creative to create a mutually fair and beneficial uh, uh, approach to acquiring practices. And that's what we're doing. I mean, we always pride ourselves in one thing. If somebody, you know, somebody come, comes up to us all the time and says, well, what's your model? What's your formula? Okay. My answer is always, no, you got to go first. What are you looking for to, to join us. Are you, if, if, if we're talking to somebody who within six to 12 months wants to have his toes in the sand in Boca and just wants to sell the goodwill or in a so-called records deal or whatever you want to call it, then we have one approach. But to me, it's really a question of how long does this person want to continue to practice and what's their philosophy. Then we structure a deal around what will work for them because I mean, I, I've been doing this a very, very long time in my in my in my many lives of of being of doing healthcare M and A, and a deal that works for one side, but not the other is a bad deal, and ultimately will implode. We need to look and make sure that the deal works for both sides. If it doesn't, we take a pass. But it has to work from the standpoint of the seller as well, with the only caveat on that being that. The easier deals are the, I want to retire in the next year deals. Those are pretty easy to structure. The deals, and, 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 and we do a handful of those. The deals of somebody who says, no, I really want to approach dentistry differently than what I have in the past. I believe in your model. I want to join the organization. Those are the ones that I think are, are the most important to us, the most creative to us in terms of building value in the company, and the ones that we have to be most careful of how we structure yeah, you, you have to have a cultural fit and you have to have a financial fit and all those things aren't, aren't conducive to any kind of a cookie cutter. They're, they require a customization approach to make sure that the deal works for both sides. So you're talking about both sides. You're talking about a dentist selling to um, your system and your model and all that. What about, does it, why, why um, does it work for, um, healthcare, like like um, like Kenneth Davis, MD, uh, President and CEO of uh, Mount Sinai Health System. Why why would he be even interested in dentistry? Why would he be interested in you? What um, it, se- it seems like we were always the uh, the redheaded dentistry, or the redheaded stepchild. Uh, we were never, you know. <laughs> um, so why uh, and dentistry has never really even been five percent of the industry. It's always slightly below. It's always like four point nine, four point seven. So why does uh, Dr. Kenneth L. Davis, MD, president of the Mount Sinai Health System, why, why is dentistry on the radar and with you? Well, I, I, I don't want to put words in Dr. Davis's mouth. I'm going to tell you what my belief is. First of all, Mount Sinai has a, re- a dental residency program. So dentistry was already on the radar screen for them to some degree. Uh, and, 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 uh, and they do perform oral surgery. I would like to think, and I do believe, 
that the driving force was a true clinical belief, because Dr. Davis, after all, is a is a physician, and 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 the same as our other clinical partners, which are all physician controlled, that they think that this is an opportunity to enhance their service offerings, provide more comprehensive care to their patients. And as I said before, it's not necessarily a one-way street that they're going to send their medical patients over for dental services. They know that our model actually helps to generate medical patients by doing clinical screenings that are generally not done in a dental office. So I think there's just a total symbiotic synergistic relationship but ultimately, it comes down to, I, I believe that Dr. Davis, as our partners, they want to do what's best for our patients. They want to provide comprehensive care to the patients. And the more that we can do that, the more that we can integrate care, just like they have done with other service lines under medicine, the more they add service lines, the more one-stop shopping and, and comprehensive care they're providing to their patients. We just add, we augment that by adding another synergistic service line. So then um, back to uh, New York City, which uh, obviously, it's so funny when you go around the world because uh, um, anytime you're lecturing in uh, Africa or Asia and someone's been in the United States, they always say, oh, I, I, they come up and tell you, I've been to the United States. And I'm like, I know what it's going to mean. It's mean they went to the Greater New York meeting in Manhattan and they think that's the United States. I grew up in Kansas and I still can remember the shock I saw. I gave my first dental lecture in New York City because I wanted to go to New York City. It was August 4th, 1990. And as a little kid from Kansas, I mean, I'll never forget it. I looked out that window. I I, I couldn't believe it. Um, But it's also Wall Street, um, the big financiers. you know, when I got out of school, Orthodontic Centers of America had done an IPO on uh, the New York Stock Exchange. It rose to over a billion valuation. There were a dozen on NASDAQ. They all imploded, and we've never seen them ever back to Wall Street again. Uh, but there's two in Australia that are publicly traded, uh, one 300 uh, Dental and um, Pacific Dental. There's one in Singapore, uh, QNAM. Why does Wall Street, how, how come when like a, um, a big DSO is, it, it just seems like all the private equity, uh, they put money in it, they build it up, they buy a bunch of practice, they merge it, then they just sell it to a bigger venture capital, then a bigger. It's like a hot potato. The, 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 the final exit strategy of instant liquidity was always the stock market. Why have we never, why, why did that stop? And do you ever think you'll be, uh, you're, you could do an exit strategy on Wall Street? Well, um, so here's what I'm going to, this is again, my view here, Howard, is this. At some point, whether you're looking at a heartland or someone who's just gotten, you know, there's nobody bigger to sell to, if you will. Wall Street's going to have to be considered as an exit because almost all private equity, as I think we all know, private equity is a you know anywhere from a short to a midterm investor. It's not a long-term investor. So ultimately, they're looking for an exit. Um, I think that that a public exit will have to be considered, unless there are other potential suitors that are larger that serve a broader scope of services than just dentistry. And whether that's health insurers, health systems, whatever, that's, that's always a possibility. But I do think that, that, and I just was having this discussion last night with somebody, I do think that we will reach a point where it has gotten too large for private equity. Uh, So that that's certainly a possibility, you know, as it relates to pro health dental, I think the only honest answer I can give you is we're only five years into this. And so exit is not something that we think about. Uh, but now, you know, do I wake up in the middle of the night and think about it at some point? Sure. And the answer is, I think that our model, unlike the typical DSL model, gives us a much broader range of potential suitors. It could be private equity. It could be a large health system. It could be a dental plan. It could be because we're really, when, when push comes to shove, what we're really doing is we're shaping a healthcare services model, not really a DSL model. And I think that's, that opens up different opportunities, but it's not something that's, that's, that's on our current radar screen. We're going to continue to build, we're going to continue to build out our model 
both locally and 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 and, and, and I believe regionally and nationally in, in, in the months and years to come. Um, I can't believe we went over an hour. That was the fastest hour in the world. It must be a, a brain food candy for me. I loved your um, your pro health dental um, uh, vi- video um, you put on Vimeo. Yeah, that, that's the video that I was mentioning that I believe has had. I know it has from our call center has had enormous response in the current COVID era. Yeah, and and I'm just curious because uh, um, what why do you put that on Vimeo instead of YouTube? I'm I'm curious when people use Vimeo. Um, what uh, what? That it- that now you're. This is a uh, a technical question. I I wouldn't know the answer to it. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, leave that, I leave that up to our marketing people. Yeah, I always wonder why they do that. But um, you have a pro health dental um, public service announcement. I really like it. I'm going to insert that in there. Um, but before we say goodbye. Um, um, I, I can't, the final question I got to ask is, um, what is your uh, relationship with the Harvard, uh, school of dental medicine? We have, we have a, uh, we have a research, uh, affiliation agreement, uh, and where we have agreed to work together to, we are, we are rolling out. Actually, it was supposed to happen just prior to, it was supposed to happen on March 15th. So that tells you what, what, why we had to, uh, pivot. Uh, we were rolling out a survey process where in our clinical affiliates, primary care offices to test public awareness on the importance of oral health. Obviously, it was all being done by paper. So now can't do things by paper anymore. We have switched to an electronic approach and we're rolling that out. The results of that will make their way into what we believe will be a publishable research paper. And we will look at other ways to work with Harvard to demonstrate the efficacy of an integrated medical dental model, which as, as you may know, you know, they're, they're just recently retired Dean Bruce Donoff was a huge advocate of published heavily on the subject and is still involved to my knowledge. So we're staying involved with Harvard because our philosophies of integrated care are totally in alignment. And I still, um, it's kind of embarrassing when you're a dentist uh, because dental caries is still the number one most common chronic disease in the world. And um, I mean, um, and our oral cancer, you know, so many of these cancers have improved so much. The five-year survival rate of oral cancer hasn't changed since freshman year of dental school for me. I mean, for 30 years, that needle hasn't moved. And, um, and then when, um, and you really need to be on the ground because when you're in the United States, uh, it might not make sense to you. But when you go to other countries like, um, you know, I'd always heard in, uh, that Africa, the doctors recommend that they drink Coke. And I'm like, no, they don't. That's got to be some crazy, you know, some crazy deal. When I went there, it's absolutely true. And, and then I was edumacated that, uh, well, if they go to the well and drink dirty water, they might die of cholera. I'm not worried about a dental cavity. I'm worried about cholera. And uh, so um, better is, uh, you know, you can't let um, better uh, or best be the enemy of better. And every physician I talk to over there, especially in like Tanza, um, you know, a lot, a lot of those countries, they're like, yeah, we, they love the processing of Coca-Cola. They, they love their systems and purification. And it's so good that the fact that it's empty calories and causes a uh, tooth rot, um, it's still, um, the number one killer is still diarrhea, um, you know. And um, they, they drink dirty water and they, they, they die of it. So dentistry's got a long research road ahead of it. I mean, God, just to, just to cut that five-year survival rate oral cancer or, or at least get dental caries off the number one, can we somehow get it to number two? <laughs> that, that would be terrific, wouldn't it? It would. And, uh, and I wanted to start with you uh, thinking outside the box, and it's it just been a great hour. But um, if you want to send back your, uh, your two legends, uh, um, Bruce and Neil, um, or we could even do it together. They, they could be in different places. We can have on uh, Zoom, we can have many, but it was just a huge honor to have you come on the show. Um, I, um, I do think that you may be the first Mayo Clinic business model in dentistry. I've been waiting a long time to see a big DSO where the number one marketing driving machine like the Mayo Clinic is quality. 
And the Mayo Clinic brothers story was in, it was very very interesting because we don't live in those times, so you don't know how people thought in those times. But in those times, when your eighty five year old grandma was really sick, everybody's like, "Well, she had a good life, and let's just make her comfortable, and you know, just let her fade away." And all the medicines were, of course, bottles that had the same ingredients: opium, alcohol, morphine, you know. And they just made her comfortable and let her die. And it was the Mayo brothers said, "No, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I know she's eighty five, but." They, there's people that just want the very best. And Mayo Clinic uh, is down here in Scottsdale. And um, it is an amazing system. And um, dentistry was always, um, you know, cheaper, faster, more retail, more available, more affordable, which is all great. But I'm glad to see that we might have, that pro health might be the first I've seen where you're, you're trying to be the Mayo Clinic of dentistry. And if you didn't, Norton. Well, thank uh, you. Thank it, you. I, I, I take that as a great compliment. And it was really a pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Well, I, I don't know if you'll make it to number one above Ken Norton. He's still my favorite Norton, uh, but uh, no, you'll be so, number two. But, uh, <laughs> and, I, and look, I grew up I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts, so I grew up with Rocky Marciano and, and Marvin Hagler. So you know, that, that's that. Now you're talking boxers. So, uh, but I'd be happy offline to have a discussion with you about heavyweight boxing because it was something that I was <laughs> really a, a big fan of in my. Uh, in my earlier years. Yeah, and, and just like innovation, who saw the, I can't believe I went from boxing being number one to UFC. I didn't see that innovation coming. It's a, And uh, it's all about innovation, um, making everything faster, better, easier, cheaper, smaller. And uh, thanks for uh, coming on the show, Norton. It was just an my honor pleasure. to podcast interview you. Have a great my day. My pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure okay. to meet you. As we resume our lives, there's never been a better time to focus on good oral health as an essential element of overall health. Clinical studies show that poor oral health can contribute to serious illnesses such as heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, and even some cancers. At ProHealth Dental, we are dedicated to improving oral and overall health through integrated medical dental care with your physician. Make an appointment today and remember to put your health where your mouth is.